As a reminder, as you're admitted from the waiting room, please mute yourselves. We'll just give it one moment for everyone to enter from the waiting room. Good morning, this is a hearing before the licensing board for the city of Boston. Today is Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. Before we begin with some housekeeping items, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Good afternoon, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm joined today by Commissioner Kiana Saxon and Commissioner Liam Curran, as well as Lieutenant Detective Troy, Detective Eddie Hernandez, and Sergeant, Sergeant Detective Gallagher. And when you are called, we do ask that you turn your cameras on. Thank you. Today's hearing is being conducted pursuant to certain amendments regarding the open meeting law. That is what allows us to meet virtually. Today's hearing is being recorded and we will be posted to the City of Boston's website. As the chairwoman stated, please ensure that you can turn your camera on as all witnesses or licensees will need to be sworn in. We will call each matter on, in the order on which they appear in the agenda. I will ask the licensee and their representatives to please state your name. I will then ask anyone from the Boston Police Department testifying or reading a police report into the record to please state their names. And finally, I will ask for any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident to state their names. I will then swear all parties in. Again, please ensure that you can turn on your camera and we will proceed with the police report. As, again, as a reminder, please mute yourselves unless, you are, unless your item has been called and you are testifying. Calling JAJB Inc. doing business as Tavern in the Square, Alston, located at 161 to 165 Brighton Avenue. The date of the incident is December 7, 2019. Patron overserved, fell downstairs in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Is the licensee and any representative present? I am, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, Robert Allen. Max Rosen, licensee. Who Good morning. Good afternoon. Who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying regarding this matter? Sergeant John McLaughlin. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge who wish to testify regarding this matter? So, uh, Chris McGee, I'm the general manager at Tavern and Square in Austin. Thank you. If you could all please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. I do. Sergeant, please proceed with the police report. Ma'am, <clears throat> at about 1 a.m. on Saturday, December 7th, 2019, Officer Masiosi in the Kilo 426 Alpha and Officer Vertiel in the Kilo 424 Alpha responded to a radio call for a police assist at 161 Brighton Avenue, Austin, Tavern in the Square. Also responding to the incident location with Sergeant McLaughlin in the 913. Upon arrival, the responding officers were escorted by Tavern in the Square staff to a basement level of the bar establishment and observed Boston EMS units A16 and A94 with a victim that reportedly fell down the stairs from the first floor to the basement level. Also on scene was Boston Fire Department Unit E41. The officers observed Holly Brulette, the victim, with swelling and a minor laceration around the area of her left eye. The victim was conscious and alert at the time of the officer's arrival. The victim had slurred speech and appeared to be under the influence of alcoholic beverages. The stairwell where the victim reportedly fell was observed dry and clear of any obstructions. The victim was transported to Beth Israel Hospital by responding EMS Unit A16 for further non-life-threatening medical evaluation and observation. Sergeant McLaughlin and the 913 unit conducted a Code 35 license premise inspection and issued a violation 003619 for over-serving of a patron. Thank you. You're welcome. Attorney Allen? Yes. Okay. Just uh, one just brief question, Sergeant. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds like it through your report, but I just wanted to confirm that uh, throughout your time there, the staff at the Tavern was cooperative with you and your colleagues? Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, Ma Madam Chair, if I may, again, <laughs> For the record, Robert Allen, 300 Washington Street in Brookline Village, here representing Tavern on the Square in Brighton. Um, obviously, we regret being here today and, and regret that a, a, a patron of ours uh, got into an accident, but 
I think once you hear the facts um, from Max Rosen, who's the operation manager, we also have, as you heard, Chris McGee, the manager at the time of the incident, you'll hear that this was just um, an unfortunate accident that occurred on the place. And this board has often emphasized certain protocol uh, that you want to see these uh, operators use. And I believe you'll hear from Mr. Rosen that these um, protocols were put in place on that particular night. And unfortunately, uh, we just had an accident. We, we cooperated with the police. Uh, we're cooperating now with the insurance company for the alleged victim uh, who, has, who has proceeded to this matter on a civil basis where I suggest to you is really where it belongs and not so much here before the board. But if I may, Madam Chair, I would turn it over to uh, Mr. Rosen and let him um, tell you uh, his follow-up of the incident report from, um, from Mr. McGee that night. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Madam Chairman, Max Rosen, Operations Leader for Tavern in the Square and overseeing the uh, JJB Inc. Uh, Tavern in the Square, Alston. On the night of the incident, Mr. McGee, uh, general manager, did contact me, uh, at which point we did follow protocols that have been established and you know, recommended from the board in the past, including um, Mr. McGee immediately calling uh, EMS support for the young lady who did fall. Video footage was pulled and all accounts um, and transactions that may or may not have been under the victim's name um, were looked for. Unfortunately, um, the victim who was present um, on the premises did not have any prior transactions, so we could not um, determine whether or not she was in, in fact overserved on premise. Um, with that being said, like Mr. Allen said, um, the video footage did show a very just unfortunate fall from about four steps up, um, at which point our door staff followed by Mr. McGee uh, took action to call EMS, um, uh, at which point she was, um, she was taken care of. And uh, just uh, briefly, was, was there any mention as to uh, anything, her clothing or her shoes that she was wearing on that particular night? I know, so the, the, the female Holly in, in question was wearing uh, quite large or long heels, um, which made it difficult to walk down the stairs from the video footage, uh, which I believe was submitted to the board. Um, with that being said, and as noted on the police report, there was no spills or observed liquid on the ground that would have caused any sort of, of fumble on her end. So Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, I'm not sure if you or the board have any questions of Mr. Rosen before I would proceed. Um, I have a couple of questions. Mr. Rosen, um, so you're saying there was no evidence of her purchasing any uh, drinks that is correct. Um, after the incident, Mr. McGee or Chris did contact me and I instructed him as we've, as we've done in the past to pull all reports and transactions for the evening and cross reference against her name to see if any credit card transactions did take place under her name. Okay. Do you know if any transactions took place with any of they, the other people she was with? That unfortunately we could not determine because we were unable to identify the other individuals that she was with. I can say and confirm that no transactions were made using her name. She said that the body of Okay. Um, do you know whether or not she consumed any alcohol on, um, on site? Video footage does show her with one single can of beer in her hand that is um, sold on premise. That is the only item that we can confirm. And that was over the entire evening? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Attorney Allen. Well, Madam Chair, again, um, the, hopefully you received the footage. We, we sent it into your office there. Um, we provided you with a, with a copy of the footage. It's not the clearest, but you can see that it appears that her ankle kind of rolled. She had high heels on, her ankle kind of rolled, and she, and she went down the stairs. At that particular time, she did have a can of beer in her hand. Um, that is the only record that we have of her uh, consuming any alcohol on that particular place. But I do want to call your attention because I think this is important and something emphasized by this board. We immediately called the police. We immediately put into protocol preserving um, the video, uh, immediately looking for all records. Um, I think we did everything we could possibly do. Unfortunately, accidents happen, and we believe that this was just an unfortunate accident to a patron of ours. Thank you. Um, 
Leslie, do we ask for victims or if anyone else is present? Is there anyone else uh, with personal knowledge regarding this alleged incident who wishes to testify? Seeing none, Commissioners Curran or Commissioner Saxon, do you have any questions for the licensee? Seeing none, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Two has been filed without a hearing. Calling item three, Luz Corporation doing business as Casa Colombia Restaurante Ice Cream and Bakery, located at 15 William C. Kelly School. The date of the incident is June 19th, 2020. No ISD posted in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.02b. Expired common vigilant license in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 140, Section 2. Is the representative from Luz Corporation and any council present? Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Attorney Perry Beltre. I represent the Luz Corporation and its owner, Luz uh, Restrepo, who is also um, at the link that says Client Link Beltre with the blue background. Yes, good afternoon, Chairwoman. My name is Attorney Cicero, and I represent Walter Corporation, who has the lease of the business. And is the representative, Attorney Cicero, your client present? Uh, he's uh, Mr. Walter Castaneda right here next to me. And who from the Boston Police Department will be reading the report into the record? Sergeant Detective William Gallagher. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the alleged incident who wish to testify? Um, to the extent that my client needs to provide any statements, I'd have to do it for her as she doesn't speak um, good English. So I could either translate for her or just represent her statements. Whichever you feel will best represent your client, counsel. Okay. Most likely it'll be me. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank you. Any individuals who wish to testify, please raise your right hand. Attorney Cicero, could you ask your client to please raise his right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Yes. Thank you. Sergeant, you can proceed with the police report. Yes, good afternoon, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Boston Police, currently assigned to licensed premise unit. This afternoon, I'll be reading from a police report that I wrote on 6-19-2020 at 10-12 p.m. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, signed to the License Premise Unit, conducted a License Premise Inspection of Casa Columbia at 15 Central Square, East Boston. Detectives were asked to swing by the premise after a neighborhood complaint regarding the new patio. Detectives observed the city benches were incorporated into Casa Columbia's patio, which the premise failed to obtain approval for. Inside the premise, detectives discovered that Casa Columbia had not obtained a City of Boston common victuals license since 2017. Detectives were also unable to locate a current inspectional services certificate. These matters were brought to the attention of the manager, Walter Conatonato, who signed for and accepted inspection notice number 024279 that was issued by Sergeant Gallagher. Those essentially are the facts. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The board is aware that there are multiple parties present today wishing to testify. We will begin with the actual licensee of record. Council, if you want to proceed. Thank you. Um, this is a situation that is um, beyond uh, the purview of the board in so much as uh, Ms. Restrepo, three years ago, exactly in 2017, when the license should have been um, renewed, signed what was the um, equivalent of a management agreement with Mr. Castaneda. She was having family issues because her son um, was battling and is battling cancer. That management agreement, in essence, um, left the responsibility to Mr. Castaneda to maintain licenses, permits, pay the DOR sales taxes, um, and other uh, uh, financial responsibilities, including rent and a portion of the revenues to her while she was um, unable and indisposed to manage her business. Uh, three years later, um, during this pandemic, Ms. Restrepo argues that he took advantage of the pandemic and the crisis and stopped paying rent um, and 
entered into a side deal with the landlord. Um, we also have issues with the landlord and not providing proper notice to quit um, and allegedly signing a lease with Mr. Castaneda, um, even though we argue that Ms. Restrepo had um, uh, the equivalent of a month to month lease as her contractual lease did expire in January 2020. Um, these issues all arise during the pandemic and around July or August of this summer, Mr. Walter Castaneda basically said he would not be honoring the contract and that he deems her to have abandoned the business, which Ms. Restrepo um, adamantly uh, uh, refutes. That being said, for what's before the board, she now acknowledges that Mr. Castaneda did not renew the license. She was unaware of that up until practically just last week or no more than two weeks ago, realized that this was even happening. We were very lucky to speak to Maureen from um, your, your office and were able to um, at least try to provide some documents to the board so that you guys could be aware of these internal issues. Um, we are under the impression and understanding that the business has been closed as of Friday and it's Ms. Restrepo's um, desire that it remain that way until certain litigation and other issues can be resolved. Um, it is her hope to be able to take possession of the premises, but that also requ requires um, other issues with the landlord. And so as far as what's before your, your her board today, she acknowledges that the license has been, um, that had never was not renewed as it was supposed to be. And she just submits that it's her hope to be able to do so. I have since um, filled out the form, um, but we're missing uh, certain documents that she doesn't have in her possession, which is the assembly permit, a valid inspection certificate as noted by the Sergeant um, Detective and a copy of any invoice. So upon possession or at least being able to get into the premises, we hope to get her organized and recoup her business. Um, and so in essence, that's that's the long and short of it. It's a very convoluted uh, situation with allegations on both parts, but um, the, the, the fact is that we cannot dispute that there's no license. Is the landlord present? Uh, no, Your Honor, uh, he's on the line on the phone. I can uh, put him on. He offered to talk to the board. Yeah, he should call into the hearing. Okay, give me one minute. He's kind of old. He's, uh, let, me, let me see if I can uh, give I him. I think one. our staff was told he was going to be joining. Yes. Yes, I'm looking for uh, Mr. Joseph Recuper. Yes, okay, uh, this is attorney Cicero and I have the board at city, the city of Boston and a, and a conference. Could you please provide the landlord the actual call in information as opposed to utilize your phone? And Madam Chair, to the extent that there's technical difficulties in getting that done, we would then request that the matter be tabled for the next hearing date. All right, we'll give it a shot. I think we need to hear a little bit more about what's going on. Sure. Mr. Joseph Recupero, I have uh, the city of Boston on the line and uh, Zoom. I'm going to send you the link because they need to talk to you about the lease. Uh, send me the link? Okay, hold on. Okay, what's the link? Uh, let me see, one minute. Let me see if I can uh, give you this. Rebecca copied it in the chat. Why don't you work on that with the landlord? Yes. Leslie, since he's not available, can we please move on to the next one out of, in the interest of everyone else's time here? We will sure. Be, we'll take a second call. We'll get a second call. Thank you. Please hang on. Calling Desang Corporation doing business as Seaport Wines and Spirits located at 411 D Street. The date of the incident is September 18th, 2020. Service of alcohol to persons under 21 in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 34, 34A, 41, 64, and 64A. 
Is the licensee and its representatives present? Uh, good morning, board. Please state your name for the uh, record. Sure. Uh, my name is Dawa Lama. I'm the owner of uh, Seaport Wine and Spirits. Thank you. Who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? Sergeant Detective William Gallagher. Thank you. Are there any other individuals with personal knowledge regarding this incident who wish to testify? Seeing none, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Sergeant, please proceed with the police report. Yes, good afternoon, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Boston Police, currently assigned to licensed premise unit. This afternoon, I'll be reading from a Boston Police incident report that I wrote. On 9-18-2020 at 9.35 p.m., Sergeant Detective William Gallagher was driving down D Street in South Boston, monitoring the licensed establishments when he observed two young looking females loitering in front of Seaport Wine and Liquors at 411 D Street. Sergeant observed the females to have a black plastic bag commonly used by liquor stores. Sergeant parked his unmarked car and approached the two females on foot. As the sergeant got closer, he could observe a clear glass bottle protruding from the bag. Sergeant identified himself as BPD and asked the young looking females if they had alcohol on the plastic bag in their possession. The females replied, it's not ours, can we just leave? Sergeant asked the females if they had purchased the liquor inside the liquor store and asked them to step back inside to speak with the clerk. Once inside the store, the sergeant, the clerk informed Sergeant Detective Gallagher that the females just made the purchase and provided IDs. Sergeant removed a full bottle of Smirnoff vodka from the plastic bag. Both females relinquished their fake IDs used to make the purchase. The females, both Boston College freshmen, were identified as Carolyn Thompson, date of birth three, I'm sorry, seven, three, 2002 of San Francisco, California, and Isabel Coleman, date of birth, 7 25, 2001 of Yarmouth, Maine. Ms. Coleman used a poor quality New Hampshire driver's license in her name with a date of birth of 7 25, 97, making her 23. The license peeled up as the detectives inspected it. Ms. Thompson used a fake California driver's license in her name with a date of birth of 7 398, making her 22. Both IDs were confiscated and will be presented at court. Both females to be charged with persons under 21 possession of alcohol and of a fraudulent registry document. The IDs in question were shown to the clerk and the owner who showed up during the inspection. The detective used an ID verification app on his phone to scan the IDs, which turned up fraudulent. As a result, the detectives had observed Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice number 023905 to Seaport Wine and Spirits for service of alcohol to persons under 21. Ms. Dawa Lama signed for and accepted the notice. Sergeant would also like to add that he found Mr. Lama difficult to deal with, claiming that he was being picked on and not having knowledge of ID scanners despite many years in business. I have a, uh, I don't have the alcohol, but I do have a picture of the bottle, the full bottle of Smirnoff. That's what the ladies had purchased that night. And uh, they do they do have their Boston College IDs. That, those were the only real identifications that they had on them. Uh, this matter yet has not been litigated in court due to COVID and uh, backup. Those essentially are the backups. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Detective. Have the ideas here. Thank you. Mr. Lama. Uh, uh, good morning, board. First, I want to say uh, sorry on behalf of my employee for not able to catch the fake ID, but we do check ID with pretty much every customer. But unfortunately, I had a new employee. Uh, he's only been there for a week, uh, and we haven't got a chance to have him uh, have the ID scanner on his phone and that was uh, my mistake and we don't have the software on that POS system 
but we did check the ID, but unfortunately it was a fake ID. Okay. Um, I can't tell if there's anybody else here who would like to testify on this matter. There are no other individuals who indicate they wish to testify. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Sure, ma'am. Um, sir, how long did this employee work for you before this um, September 18th? Uh, he's been there for only a week. And a week. because uh, my older employee left because of the pandemic, and during this whole pandemic, uh, you know, nobody wants to work. And that whole area was pretty much like, you know, like a dead zone. Uh, and it's not a, a college neighborhood or either residential neighborhood. And we are usually pretty uh, strict on ID, but and it's not the neighborhood where you'll see a lot of kids. Okay. But that, what is, okay. What is your usual process for checking IDs? Uh, we have uh, the ID scanner on our phone. Okay. And at uh, other stores, we have the ID scanner on the POS system. But that particular store, uh, we don't have the ID scanner. And then, unfortunately, the new employee uh, didn't get to, basically, it was my fault, not because he's been only there for a week. And we ha haven't got a chance to tell him to upload, basically, download the app on his phone. Okay. And Sergeant, did you testify that the employee said he had worked there for a long time? No, uh, I was talking to the gentleman just on, um, okay. on the screen, and he, he had stated that uh, he didn't didn't have any knowledge of these apps, and I was explaining to him, this is just a simple download to a phone or a tablet. You don't need to have this fancy, expensive equipment to check these IDs. Okay. Okay, um, Commissioner Curran, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Commissioner Saxon, do you have any questions? Curious about the quality of the California license. You said the New York, New Hampshire one wasn't very good. Was yeah, the, the New Hampshire one. You're right. Uh, there was it was kind of uh, kind of flimsy and uh, it, it didn't look that good. Uh, you know, you might have questioned it and asked for another form of ID. Uh, all she had was her BC ID with her and probably her credit card, which isn't a valid form of identification, but she didn't really have anything else. The California one was of a better quality. Okay. We, we did check the ID and sometimes it's hard to tell uh, unless we use the scanner. And unfortunately that night with the new guy, we didn't have the scanner on the phone. But uh, but it wasn't like you know we wasn't we weren't checking IDs but we did we were checking IDs. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Seeing no other individuals who wish to testify, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank you. Calling item five, Tamworth Saloon LLC, doing business as TAM, located at 222 Tremont Street. The date of the incident is August 27th, 2020. Premise not serving food with alcohol, Governor's Directive, dated 8720, food and alcohol served together. Food prepared on site in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Is the licensee and their representatives present? Yes, Michael Floyd representing the licensee with me, uh, my client, Brian O'Donnell. Brian O'Donnell here. Thank you. Who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? I will be. Detective Fernandez. And are there any individuals with personal knowledge who wish to testify regarding this matter? Sergeant William Gallag, I might have to testify. I was there as well with Detective Fernandez. Thank you, Sergeant. If all parties could raise their right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Detective Fernandez. You can proceed with the police report. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from a police report which, uh, which I wrote on Thursday, August 27, 2020, about 10:26 p.m. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, assigned to the license premise unit, along with inspectional services department inspectors, responded to the TAM located at 222 Tremont Street to perform an inspection of the bar. While walking inside, detectives observed all patrons were provided popcorn and not eating food while consuming alcohol. Detectives reiterated the importance of the governor's and 
Boston Licensing Board's August 7th advisory on the service of food prepared on site and that food must be served in conjunction with the consumption of alcohol. Detectives brought this to the attention of the person in charge, Ms. Jean Mon. <clears throat> As a result of what detectives observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license premise inspection notice 0239344, premise not serving food with alcohol in violation of governor's directive. Ms. Mar signed for and accepted the notice. Those are essentially the facts. Okay, good. Uh, briefly, good afternoon. Um, you answered about 10 30. Yes, sir. Approximately. Okay, it's fair to say the report uh, doesn't indicate that you saw any new patrons come in and sit down, correct? While we were there, patrons did come in, yes. I, I just, I didn't know that in your report, correct? No, it wasn't in the report. Okay, and um, did you see what was uh, ordered with the first drink? I don't understand, with who? Did you see any, did you observe any of the orders? We just noticed what was on, on the uh, on the bar, sir. Fair enough. Uh, and did you see a popcorn making machine on the bar? Yes. Okay. And did you talk to the manager about the turkey sandwiches that were also being served? We, we saw some sandwiches that were in a small little uh, fridge. Okay. So they had, it's fair to say they had, they had turkey sandwiches for uh, order, correct? We didn't see anybody consuming any. But they had them on the premises. Yes. Okay. And they had a food service permit, correct? Uh, I, I don't remember seeing one. Okay. And then just, just a couple, couple of uh, safety questions. All the employees were wearing masks, right? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, patrons were wearing masks when they walked around? Yes. And the tables were six feet apart? Yes. And most importantly, did, were they cooperative with you, the licensing? Yes. Okay. I have nothing... Uh, I have nothing further. Thank you very much, Detective. Um, just go right into it. We only have one witness. Uh, just as a heads, you know, heads up, uh, we had the, the exact same violation for the exact same uh, like hour and day with the ABCC, and uh, that's that's uh, that's pending. Uh, the way they'll present this, it's really in three parts for all of you. Uh, the, the argument they have to make with respect to the plain reading of a statute regulation. The second part is what they're doing to increase their, man, their uh, menu and what they're doing to make sure that um, the, you know, the public safety is... Uh, is um, so I just asked Mr. O'Donnell, would you introduce yourself to the, uh, to the board? Um, good afternoon. My name is Brian O'Donnell. I'm manager okay. of now. All right. And what's your experience? Um, currently the owner of Lower Mills Tavern and uh, Yellow Door Talk Korea. I've been the manager at McGreevy's on Boylston Street for, for 11 years until it closed. And have you ha uh, been handling the uh, general uh, management for the uh, TAM? I have. Okay. And uh, does the TAM have a food services permit? It does. Okay, and uh, has it had that it, since prior to this incident? It was issued for uh, COVID after we uh, submitted a plan. All right, I'm just getting to the pup, uh, into the popcorn. Uh, do, do you bring that in from offsite? We make it on site. Okay, do you have a, uh, describe how you make it on site? Uh, we go through about 200 pounds of kernels every day. I mean, uh, each week. Uh, we cook it on site, season it on site, and then we give it to each guest with their uh, initial order for alcohol. All right. And what else do you? Uh, what else do you? What else were you serving that uh, day with respect to the sandwiches? Uh, every few days ago, in we make sandwiches on site, turkey sandwiches, and they're available for sale. And in addition to that, uh, we had an inspection from the health department, and they said that there was an issue with. Uh, uh, ingredients so then we brought in a microwave and now we're doing heated uh, like ham and cheese frozen things that we uh... okay I want to jump in attorney Ford and mr. O'Donnell I appreciate both of you for being here um, we'll reach out to you this should have been just a phone call um, we'll work with you to make sure you're complying with all the rules and regulations so I apologize for taking your time and good luck okay thank, thank you so much thank you thank you very much
calling GNV Brighton Mart Inc. doing business as Babushka Deli, located at 62 Washington Street. The date of the incident is September 9th, 2020. Sale of alcohol to persons under 21 of eight in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 34, 34A, 41, 64, and 64A. Is the licensee and or their representatives present? Yes, good afternoon, Carolyn Conway. On behalf of the licensee, uh, Mr. Nero Patel is also on with us as the representative of the licensee. Mr. Patel, could you please turn on your video? Yes. While you turn that on, who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? I will be. Detective Fernandez? Are there any additional individuals with personal knowledge of the incident who wish to testify? Sergeant Detective Weldon Gallagher, if called upon. Thank you, Sergeant. Seeing no additional individuals, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Detective Fernandez, you may proceed with the police report. Okay. Um, on Friday, September 11th, 2020, at about 9.55 p.m., Sergeant Detective William Gallon, Detective Eddie Hernandez, was assigned to the licensed supremacy unit, responded to Babushka Deli, located at 62 Washington Street. Detectives went there to speak to the staff regarding a complaint that had been received regarding underage BC students purchasing alcohol at their establishment. While parked across the street from the deli, detectives observed two males later identified as David uh, DeLucia and Seth Monfiston walking outside of the deli with two 12 packs of twisted tees each. Detectives noticed that these males looked young and watched them get into a motor vehicle parked down the street. Detectives stopped the males and asked them to produce identification to confirm their ages. Both individuals immediately stated that they were under 21 years of age. When asked how they obtained the alcohol, detectives saw them walk out of the store with Mr. DeLucia, produced a fraudulent New Hampshire driver's license, stating he was over 21 years of age. Detectives used a license verification program, which confirmed that the New Hampshire driver's license Writer Mr. DeLucia was fraudulent. Detectives took photographs of Mr. DeLucia's valid New York driver's license along with the fraudulent New Hampshire driver's license. The fraudulent driver's license was confiscated by detectives. Upon speaking with Mr. Montreston, he was only able to provide a valid BC school identification card. Detectives were able to confirm that uh, Mr. Montreston did have a current New York state driver's identification card. It should be noted that in the passenger side of the motor vehicle was a uh, Boston College student, uh, John Khalil, who was 21 years of age, was only in possession of his valid BC College identification card. Mr. DeLucia and Mr. Montreson will be summoned to court for persons under 21 in possession of alcohol. Mr. DeLucia will also be summoned to court for possession of fraudulent driver's license. Uh, store staff stated they did not use they do not use a licensed authentication machine and we're only looking to see if the age of the customer is over 21 years of age and that the picture matches the person. As a, as a result of what detectives observed, Chief Detective Gallagher issued a licensed premise inspection notice 024253 for sale of alcohol to persons under 21 years of age. Mr. Vora signed for and accepted the notice and this is the uh, actual fraudulent uh, New York driver's license here. That is all. Thank you. Attorney Conway. Oh, yes. Um, as the board may know, this is a, a package store that is near an elderly housing and we most, most of our clientele is elderly and, and local residents, but we have taken this matter very much to heart. Uh, Mr. Nero Patel, we have put in the, uh, a scanner system now. We have also put in a system that no matter what age you are, you have to get um, ID'd and the ID run through the system. We have undertaken and now everyone is uh, TIP certified and we have fired that employee and we have upped our, our camera game as well so that we're um, being able to monitor uh, the, the register and the employees at all times. Mr. Patel takes this very, very seriously. And so we want to say to the board that uh, we, we honestly, uh, this seemed like an aberration with this employee, but we want to make sure that going forward that we have everything together and this won't happen again. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I don't have any questions. Commissioner Curran, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Commissioner Saxon, do you have any questions? Again, is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this matter? Seeing no one, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you very much. Calling Trattoria Il Panino Hanover Inc. doing business as Trattoria Il Panino Hanover Inc. located at 278 to 282 Hanover Street. The date of the incident is September 13th, 2020. Persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 34A, 34C, 64, and 64A is the licensee and or their representatives present. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Attorney William Ferrula for the licensee and Joseph uh, De Pasquale should be on as well. Mr. De Pasquale, are you present? Yes, I am. Thank you. And who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying regarding this matter? I will be. Detective Hernandez. Are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the incident who wish to testify? Uh, Detective Gallagher, call upon. Thank you, Sergeant. Could you all please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Detective Hernandez, you may proceed with the police report. Good morning. I'll be reading from police report, which I wrote. Um, on Sunday, September 13, 2020, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, assigned to the license premise unit, conducted an inspection of Chateria Panino, located at 280 Hanover Street in Boston. While walking by the outside patio of the establishment, detectives observed a table of two males and two female patrons drinking alcoholic beverages. Detectives noted that these males and three these males and females looked young. Detectives asked the patrons to produce identification to confirm their ages. Initially, the two females stated they were over 21 years of age and produced out-of-state driver's licenses, stating they were both over 21 years of age. Upon further investigation, detectives were able to confirm that Erica Carney and Gabriella Smith were under 21 years of age. Detectives asked the group have they obtained the beverages they had in front of them. The underage females produced a fraudulent Rhode Island uh, from Ms. Carney and a fraudulent Delaware from Ms. Smith's driver's license that contained the individual's name but displayed a date of birth that made it appear as though they were over 21 years of age. Detectives used a license verification program which can confirm that the driver's licenses were indeed fraudulent. The fraudulent driver's licenses were conf confiscated by detectives. The underage individuals will be summoned to the court for a person under 21 possession of alcohol and possession of fraudulent identification. It shall be noted that the two males, Eric Bang and Yazer Bellatif, were confirmed to be over 21 years of age. These individuals will be summoned to court for procuring alcohol for persons under 21 years of age. Detectives brought this uh, situation to the attention of the person in charge, Maria uh, Delavicio. As a result of what detectives observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license permits inspection notice 024254. Persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise. Ms. Delavicio signed for and accepted this notice. Those are essentially the facts and the Delaware and Rhode Island license uh, right here. Thank you. Oh. Attorney Furlan? Uh, yes, Detective. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, the the two males were also uh, ID'd, uh, and Mr. Koa produced a driver's license indicating he was 27. Um, who are we talking about there, sir? Uh, the two the two males that were present with the two women. Yes, they were they were over 21 years of age, sir. Okay, and uh, I see by the driver's license that Mr. Cole was uh, 27 and Mr. Batavia was 24. Yes. Okay, uh, and um, the staff uh, fully cooperated with you that evening? Yes, sir. And this is a, a dine-in restaurant, uh, needless to say, with uh, nowadays uh, an outdoor patio? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Detective. Uh, either you or, uh, I'm sorry, but either you or Detective Gallagher uh, suggested to the staff that they look into this uh, uh, app that allows you to uh, scan uh, licenses. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, members of the board, uh, uh, this 
this is a dining restaurant in the North End. Um, the staff did uh, ask for receive ID from the four individuals uh, who, uh, although youthful, ranged in age uh, to 27 years old. Um, they did not have this app. Um, it, it is not a, a bar or a club or anything like that. It's a restaurant. Uh, they now do. Um, uh, Mr. De Pasquale, who's on the line, has uh, met with the staff uh, to instruct them that uh, when they ask for IDs, if uh, they are out of state and the people appear young, uh, to bring it to the attention of uh, the manager on duty. Uh, the manager on duty uh, has the app now. Uh, Mr. De Pasquale has the app on his phone as well. Uh, so we will, uh, going forward in the future, uh, be checking those uh, uh, in the event that we have, you know, potentially students in the area and so forth. Uh, but in this instance, as I said, uh, uh, we did check them, uh, but uh, they appeared to be valid IDs, although out of state. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Mr. De Pasquale can answer any questions that you may have as well. Are there any other individuals with personal knowledge regarding this incident who wish to testify? No one has indicated they wish to testify. Thank you. Um, so just to sum up, Attorney Furlo or perhaps your client um, can just affirm, you n now have the app and you will use it for out-of-state IDs and for anyone who looks um, under 21? Correct. Okay. Um, I don't have any questions. Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon, do you? No. Seeing no questions, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank you. Calling item eight, Henna and Nova Corp doing business as Norvia's Place, located at 2801 to 2807 Washington Street. The date of the incident is September 19th, 2020. Assault and battery, patron on patron, in violation of in front of premise, violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64, Chapter 265, Section 13A. Is the licensee or its representative present? Yes, good afternoon, Carolyn Conway, and Norvia Pena is also on with us today. Hello. I see Ms. Pena, who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? Detective Hernandez. And are there any individuals with personal knowledge additional individuals with personal knowledge regarding this incident who wish to testify? Yes, Harris Hardaway, bar manager. Thank you, if you could all please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes, we do. Thank you. Detective Hernandez, you may proceed with the police report. Um, is he muted? Detective yes, Hernandez. sorry. All right. So I'll be read, I'm reading from a police report that um, uh, was authored by uh, Officer Brian Stallings. At about 1.07 a.m. on Saturday, um, September 19th, 2020, Officer Stallings and Officer Stark in the uh, Bravo Kilo 02 Alpha did make an on-site firearm arrest of Mr. David Darby in the area of 9 Valentine Street in Roxbury. Officers were on a routine patrol when a radio call for a fight in the area of, of Washington Street at Martin Luther King Boulevard. An additional unit, a call for a fight and a call for shots fired in the area of Nine Mountain came in. Officers made their way down um, Martin Luther King Boulevard towards Washington Street when they observed a large crowd, about 40 people fighting and arguing outside of the Fort Hill Bar and Grill, 2805 Washington Street. Officers began to scan the crowd and observed a male later identified as David Darby arguing with someone. Officer Stark immediately observed Mr. Darby to be holding what he knew to be a firearm in his hand while arguing with an unknown individual at the time, which he alerted Officer Stallings. Officer Stallings and Stark observed Mr. Darby putting the firearm into his waistband. Officers immediately exited the department cruiser wearing plain clothes with their badges on their outermost garments and ballistics vests with Boston police vocal patches and bold lettering. Officers gave several commands <clears throat> to Mr. Darby to drop the gun and told him to stop. Officers observed Darby to begin to run away from officers towards Valentine Street. Officers continued to give multiple verbal commands for Darby to drop the gun and stop running. 
It should be noted that a large crowd began to follow the foot chase and attempt to interfere with the police. This includes an unidentified female who attempted to trip Officer Starkey during the foot chase. As officers began to chase Darby down Valley Street, officers observed Darby moving his hands, his hand manipulating his waistband area. Officers then observed Mr. Darby throw the firearm on the ground in front of 9 Valentine Street. As officers were still chasing Mr. Darby, officers heard a metallic thud consistent with a firearm being dropped or thrown on the ground. Officer Starkey yelled to Officer Stallings, he just threw it, and Officer Stallings began to search the area of the sidewalk where the sound came from, and Officer Starkey stated Mr. Darby had thrown it, thrown it. A citizen who was on the porch of 9 Valentine Street stated, I heard it fall, referring to the firearm. Officer Stallings then observed a sock containing a firearm right in front of 9 Valentine Street on the street next to the curb. The firearm was inside of a black sock. Officer Stallings broadcast that he found the firearm over Channel 3 as Officer Starkey continued to chase Darby down Valentine Street, taking a left onto Thorn Street and then down Thorn Street onto Vale, where Mr. Darby continued to run into a side yard of 51 Vale. It should be noted that the entire length of the foot pursuit Officer Starkey gave verbal commands, which Darby ignored. Due to the large crowd interfering with the pursuit and surrounding officers, multiple units from B2 and B3 and the gang unit arrived on scene to assist it's multiple units being mentioned in there. Um, Officer, um, Officer Starkey finally caught up with Mr. Darby in the backyard of 51 Vale Street as Officer Starkey was attempting to place Darby into custody. Two females and a male who were associates of Mr. Darby began to fight Officer Starkey. With the assistance of the Bravo 201, officers were able to place Mr. Darby into custody and made the crowd back up. It should be noted that uh, one of the females got into Officer Starkey's face recording him. Well, uh, when Officer Starkey told the female to get out of his face, she said, I'm not in your face. Your face is up here and physically touched his nose. Officer Starkey then pushed the female away to create distance. The Bravo 201 transported Mr. Starkey back to B2. During this incident, the crime scene was established and secured with yellow crime scene tape. Sergeant McDougal observed Mr. El Elvis the Cruiser walking up to the tape threatening officers and was warned multiple times to leave the area. The cruiser continued to be argumentative, threatening and yelling at officers. Sergeant McDougal observed this is a cruiser ripping down yellow crime scene tape. And at that point, it was placed into handcuffs and transported to District 2. Based on Mr. Darty's prior um, criminal history, including multiple firearm charges and convictions for armed robbery, officers knew Mr. Darby is unable to legally possess a firearm. Mr. Darby was charged with unlawful possession of a large capacity feeding device, unlawful possession of a loaded firearm, unlawful possession of a firearm without a FID card, unlawful possession of a firearm, unlawful possession of ammunition, and resisting arrest. Mr. Darby had a previous conviction for unlawful possession of a firearm out of Boston Federal Court, an armed robbery conviction out of Suffolk Superior, and a trafficking uh, Class B uh, conviction out of Dorchester Court. He is initially charged with armed career, Criminal level two, Mr. De Cruz was charged with uh, disorderly conduct and interfering with police investigation. The firearm was found to be a Smith & Wesson SW9940 caliber pistol with one 40 uh, caliber round in the chamber and 12 40 caliber rounds in the magazine. Uh, District two detectives and uh, Burns and Diaz on scene photographed and processed the firearm. PDA Caitlin Fitzgerald notified. That's the first report. And I, I additionally wrote a report um, on Thursday, September 24, 2020, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, assigned to the PPD Licensed Premise Unit, rep responded to the Ford Hill Bar and Grill located at 2805 Washington Street, Boston, to speak to the staff regarding an incident that had occurred on September 19, 2020, which I just read. Um, detectives spoke to owner uh, Norvia Pena, who stated that on the night in question, she witnessed a fight in front of her establishment. The fight involved patrons that had been inside her establishment. Uh, Ms. Pena stated that she called 911 to assist with breaking up the altercation and has fully cooperated with police. As a result of what detectives became aware of, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice 02407 to Fort Hill Barn Grill for AB, uh, patron on patron in front of premise. Ms. Pena signed yes, for it, the notice. Uh, those are essentially the facts. Thank you, Detective. Um, this, this, what happened this night was this was a private party of approximately 25 people of a sit down dinner. And they were separated to tables of six in, in line with the COVID regulations. 
towards the end of the night, the patrons were standing, they were refusing to put on masks, and as a result, Ms. Pena said the party's over and wrapped up the food for everyone and sent them, sent them out the door, and they were, they were cooperative. However, we were very close to our neighbors there, and not only in proximity, uh, but also we maintain a constant contact with the neighbors. And it was shortly thereafter that Ms. Pena got a call from one of the neighbors that there were people congregating outside and that they heard yelling. She went outside, tried to get the people to move along. They resisted her and she turned around and said to her daughter who was there, call 911. Uh, so we, we called 911, assured that they, they were coming, and the rest of this just happened. It's a, it's a very busy intersection, but we don't believe, or we did not believe, that anybody who was in our premises had a firearm at all. Uh, it, was a, it was a fairly decent dinner until the end of the night when the patrons just no longer wanted to um, wear masks and socially distance that it became out of out of hand and that's when we shut it right down and as i said we had no problem with them uh norvia if you will agree with me no problem with the wrapping up of the food having them get out going we did not anticipate that there was a problem but as soon as we realized that it was that it was we called thank you uh detective was the licensee cooperative yeah yes she, she was okay um, and was the person who had the gun at the dinner party? Yes. We believe so. Okay. And how long was the dinner party? The dinner started. Oh, losing you. Harvey, I couldn't hear you. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. The the dinner started at eight. They started arriving between eight and eight thirty. Everything was on from nine to nine ten thirty, and then by eleven, that's when this you know they will started getting hyped. So okay. they wanted to be at the patio. So and then you know by by twelve twelve thirty, I said party's over. Go home. I took out the rest of the food. They they paid about seven hundred dollars. I asked them. To, we did a buffet for like almost seven hundred dollars worth of food, and I, you know, it's so bad that this instance happened, ended up this way because it was a beautiful sit down dinner. Wait till you see the camera, the videos, the pictures. It was beautiful. Um, when I asked them that for them to go, I didn't have no risk. They didn't fight back. They didn't argue, and then they left. They pick up the food. They finish up their drinks and they they left also that i wanted to, to tell the board is a lot of people that it was outside it was not inside of the premises so what i think i don't know what happened when they left if, it, if you're going to see that on the video they left quietly they were hugging each other and then when we got out it was not a 40 people fight there were two people in their faces talking loud and pushing each other around. And it was more people around it trying to stop the fight. I mean, trying to stop for them not to fight. Okay. And then all of a sudden, that's when the police came. That guy was uh, three houses away from the premises. But the, the there were people, they were there, even that guy, the lady, they, they, they almost made trip the police officer. That lady was not inside. So, okay. I just want to let you know that I'm two minutes away from the park. Every time there's something, they all run. This is not the first time where we have fight outside. They don't have nothing to do with us, but I really don't know what happened after they left. Okay. Norvia, maybe it's the gentleman with you. Was he working that night? Yes, ma'am. Was there any evidence while you were working that a fight might occur? No. Um, they were just uh, really hyped. Um, and then Myself, as well as the other staff, kept saying, hey, put your mask on. If you are not at a table seated, you have, you're walking around, you have to wear a mask. You know, um, they were just eating and they just weren't listening. And so okay. we take COVID very seriously here. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Also, I wanted to say that on that day, I had two um, 
uh, two people outside checking people in. So you're gonna see that on the cameras. I have two people outside. I have the two bartenders. I have two waitresses, myself and the manager. Just to thank make you. Sure everything went well inside of here. We we will send you the video. We have um, the night of this incident. We gave the police the video, uh, all the video we have. I tried to do it today, and the file is corrupted. So we're gonna redo it, and we'll send you the video. But we we have the video. We want we want you to see it. As you okay, can see, you. That there's no problem inside. Thank you both. Um, I have no further questions. Uh, uh, Commissioner Saxon, Commissioner Curran, do you have any questions? Question, thanks. No, thank you. Okay. No thank questions. you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on to the next item, I'm going to ask Attorney Cicero, could you please stop contacting my staff until we get to your item? We'll get to you in due time, okay? Thank you. Yes, I got the lander. Finally got the lander. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, please stop emailing. Thank sure, you. Thank you. Calling item nine, Thailand International Corporation doing business as House of Siam, located at 524, 542 Columbus Avenue. The date of the incident is September 24th, 2020. A, man a mandatory informational hearing regarding ownership, beneficial interest in the licensee entity. The manager of record of the licensee entity, oversight and control of the day-to-day -day operations of the licensee entity, and execution and filing of the annual renewal application for the licensee entity in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 15A, Chapter 138, Section 16A, Section 20, Section 26, and Section 64. Is the licensee or their representative present? I'm the owner. Please state your name for the record, sir. Juan Chad from Jantip. I'm the owner of the restaurant. Thank you. You're welcome. Who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? Sergeant Detective Gallagher. Thank you, Sergeant. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge who wish to testify regarding this matter? Seeing none, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Sergeant, you may proceed with police report. Yep. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Boston Police, currently assigned to licensed premise unit. This afternoon, I'll be reading from a Boston Police incident report that I wrote on 9-24-2020 at 9-24 p.m. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Detective Eddie Hernandez, assigned to the licensed premise unit, conducted a licensed premise inspection of the House of Siam at 542 Columbus Ave. Inside the premise, detectives met the new owner, Carl Schott Monguant, who stated that the previous owner had passed away back on April 13th. Mr. Monguant stated that the prior owner was his uncle, and he believed that the business was now in probate. Detectives informed them that he must start the process of changing the manager with the licensing board to reflect the new ownership. Mr. Monguant stated that he had started the process. Detectives provide licensing board contact information to Mr. Mogwant. As a result, what detectives had observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice number 024080 to the House of Siam for failure to notify the licensing board of change of manager. Mr. Mogwant signed for and accepted the notice. Those essentially are the facts. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, sir, Hi. is it is it your um, uncle who passed away in April? Yes, it's uh, Mr. Jim Jim Roger. He's a uh, he's a uh, death certificate. He passed away in April, and the officer another first officer is a uh, Ban Chong. He is uh, my spouse. He passed away November last year. Okay. Yep. Leslie, does I mean, do you want to help him? And and right now I got a probate order and order and right now I'm le personal representative, uh, Mr. Ban Chong Yu Wan Yong Di. Can I send a file to you that show show to you? Yes, sir. Okay. If you could, and we'll we'll put the licensing board email in the chat. I know that we had been trying to reach out to a contact. But especially with upcoming renewals, it is imperative that we have all of the uh, requisite information for the renewal. 
and as well as the changes um, that need to be made to the corporation. So if you could, we'll, again, we'll put the licensing board email in the chat, but please reach out immediately. Okay, sure. Okay. And we're gonna need to work with you to make sure we have a proper uh, manager of record Yep. This location, and there's a couple of qualifying things that we need in order to um, approve whoever's in charge as manager okay, of record. So please get in touch with our office. Okay, sure. Sure, I will do it as soon as possible. I will let my lawyer do it, okay? Okay, what is, what is your lawyer's name? Leslie, do we have his lawyer's name so we could follow up directly to? I don't believe so. <clears throat> What's your attorney's name, sir? Hi. My attorney's name is... Um, Louis has killed. Louis has killed. Louis, Louis has killed. Okay. Does he? Do you have his phone number? Just so we can make sure we reach out to him properly. Okay. Give me one second. I have in my cell phone. One second. Okay. Nine seven eight four five nine eight three five nine. Thank you, sir. We'll be sure to reach out with him to discuss next steps. Okay, and I have to, this is uh, his uh, his uh, his name uh, for the for the lawyer Haskell. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll be in All right. Yes. We'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Item 10, and Frata LLC doing business as Ward 8, located at 90 North Washington Street. The date of the incident is September 26, 2020. Assault and battery on a pedestrian walking by premise on public way. Law, Chapter 138, Section 64. Chapter 265, Section 22. Is the licensee and or their representative present? Uh, yes. Um, again, this is Attorney William Ferrillo on behalf of uh, Prado, uh, LLC doing business as Ward 8. Uh, we should also have on the line <clears throat> the owner manager, uh, Nicholas Frateroli, uh, the operations manager, Michael Wyatt, and the uh, bartender who was uh, present that evening. His name is uh, Julian Bernal, B-E-R-N-A-L. Thank you. It appears I see Michael Wyatt. I see Julian. Is Mr. Frateroli present with his camera on? I do not see Mr. Frateroli, but I believe we can counsel if you're if you're comfortable, we can proceed with the individuals who are present. Yes, he 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 was not. Uh, he was not present, uh, uh, Mr. Bernal was, but uh, uh, we can proceed accordingly. Thank you. And who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? I will be. Detective Fernandez. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of the incident who wish to testify? Seeing none, if everyone could please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Detective Hernandez, you may proceed with the police report. Yeah, I'll be reading from a, initially from a police report, which was authored by uh, Officer uh, Garcia. Uh, at about 1.18 a.m. on Saturday, 9 26, 2020, Officer Garcia and the Alpha 426 Alpha responded to a radio call for a fight outside of 90 North Washington Street, Ward 8 restaurant. On arrival, officer observed a white male later identified as Michael Sullivan being attended to by three females who witnessed uh, the victim being assaulted. The victim was observed bleeding from the nose and mouth and with a swollen left eye and a swollen lower right side of his face. Officer spoke with the three females, um, Shania Torres, uh, Courtney Kiley, and uh, Elena Oliveira. Uh, the, the three stated that while traveling on North Washington Street, they observed the male victim being assaulted by a group of four males outside of the Ward 8 restaurant and added that the suspects left on foot on Medford Street towards Causeway. They described the suspects as a group of four white males all in their early 20s and gave the description of one male wearing a black shirt and jeans. Officers requested EMS and the PS on scene. Officers spoke with the bartender of Ward 8 
restaurant, Julian Bernal, who stated that he witnessed the group that had just left the restaurant assaulting the victim. Mr. Bernal stated that he immediately called 911 and went outside to help the victim. Officer observed the victim's uh, seating on a chair from the restaurant and observed Mr. Bernal bringing the victim restaurant towels with ice and water. Officers also observed other restaurant towels dirty with blood scattered around the scene, which Mr. Bernal used to render aid to the victim. Mr. Bernal stated that prior to the incident, the suspects were inside the restaurant in a group of nine, five males and four females. Mr. Bernal stated that the four females left before the males and paid for their tab, but the four males left without paying. M1C15 responded and promptly transported the victim to MGH for evaluation and treatment. Alpha 906 Sergeant Whiteman responded to the scene and notified Sergeant Detective Gallagher, who will follow up the uh, Code 39 license premise inspection. Officers responded to the MGH emergency room to speak uh, to, to gather the victim information. The victim, Sullivan, stated that he had just left the greatest bar before he ran into the group of suspects outside of Ward 8 restaurant. Sullivan stated that he was alone and that he doesn't know the suspects. When asked how the incident initiated, Mr. Sullivan did not provide further information and only stated he was beat up by four males. That is a sense of the facts for the first report. Uh, second report, which I, which I wrote, was on Saturday, September 26, 2020, at about 11, 11 p.m. Side Detective Gallagher and Detective Hernandez, signed to the license premise unit, responded to Ward 8, located at 90 North Washington Street to speak to the staff regarding the assault and battery that occurred earlier that day. Detective spoke to manager Nicholas Sullivan, who confirmed that his staff had informed him of the incident. Mr. Sullivan informed Detective Hernandez that detectives had already contacted him and his establishment would be providing video to the investigators. As a result of the incident, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license premise inspection notice 02082 for A and B patrons on pedestrian walking by premise on public way. Mr. Sullivan signed for and accepted the notice. Those are essentially the facts. Thank you. Uh, yes, the uh, detective, uh, uh, you recited the, uh, the facts, but uh, you were present the uh, evening of the incident. Is that correct? Not present, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we have Mr. Burnell, who was uh, to give you a, a summary, and then we'll have uh, Mr. Burnell add to this and answer questions is um, this was the end of the evening. Uh, as, as mentioned, these uh, four men came into the restaurant at about 1230. Um, the only other parties in the restaurant at the time was uh, another table of five women uh, who was seated at the front towards the windows. Uh, th these men sat at the table next to them <clears throat> and, you know, conversed with them uh, while they ordered uh, around the drinks and some appetizers. Um, about 15 minutes after that, at about a quarter to one, the uh, table with the women uh, left the restaurant. Um, I would point out these aren't the same women that are mentioned in the report, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, at approximately one o'clock, uh, the bartender, uh, Mr. Burnell, uh, brought the check over to the table with the four men, uh, told them that the, the restaurant was closing uh, and left the check with them and went back to uh, closing out at the bar. Uh, they were the last people in the restaurant. Um, soon thereafter, the uh, gentleman got up and left. Um, Mr. Bernal assumed that the uh, waiter had uh, picked up that check, uh, which we found out later that that was not the case. Um, Mr. Bernal shortly thereafter, again, about five or 10 minutes later, went forward to uh, clean off that table. Uh, this restaurant has large windows in the front. Uh, he could see through the window that there was a, a scuffle going on on the sidewalk and could see that uh, it involved the four men that had just left. At that time, he didn't know there was a, a fifth man involved, uh, this Mr. Sullivan. Uh, he went outside, uh, saw that, uh, Mr. Sullivan was on the ground and that these individuals uh, were beating him. Uh, he rushed over, separated them, uh, and went to Mr. Sullivan's uh, assistance. He then uh, called on his phone for 911 to report to the police. 
informed the four individuals that he had called the police and they were on their way. At that point, they ran from the scene, uh, as noted in the report. Uh, at that time also, uh, these three women that were mentioned were uh, coming down North Washington Street, one of which uh, was an EMT uh, and assisted uh, Mr. Burnell in um, uh, helping the, uh, the victim here uh, who was bleeding. Uh, they went in, they got towels, uh, they got a chair, they got some water for him, et cetera, uh, waiting for the ambulance uh, and the police to respond. Uh, those women who were not in the restaurant either uh, stayed on the scene as well. Uh, the police came. Uh, they were informed as to what took place. Uh, this was not something that uh, started in the restaurant. Uh, the victim was not in the restaurant at all uh, that evening, and we have no idea you know, what took place outside on the sidewalk after they left. Uh, when um, the police officers asked uh, uh, if they could see the check uh, from that table, it was discovered that, in fact, these individuals had not paid the check and the uh, waiter who was on duty uh, mistakenly thought that they were included in the same check as those women. Uh, we turned over the information uh, from the women that were at the other table who had uh, paid the check on several different credit cards, so we provided that to the police. Um, subsequently, we sent the copy of uh, uh, the video to uh, your office at the licensing board uh, it doesn't show much about uh, the outside other than, you know, some sort of a scuffle going on. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Burnell, who can uh, respond to your questions, called the uh, police department immediately, uh, was the one who broke up the fight uh, and also rendered uh, assistance along with the uh, woman who was the EMT. Um, I think... Uh, we did everything that we could under these circumstances, but as, as I'm saying, uh, it was not related to any service of the bar. Uh, and the four individuals were only in there uh, for 30 minutes uh, between 12.30 and approximately one o'clock. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? I mean, to add to it, or are you all set attorney for Oh uh, Well, again, I have, uh, uh, Mr. Burnell, who's the one that uh, was on duty, called the police, uh, rendered the assistance. If you have any questions, you know, for him, you, you, please feel free to ask him. Okay. Mr. Burnell, was this foreseeable that a fight would take place outside? Uh, not at all. Um, right before, um, like I said, the, uh, like William said, the four gentlemen that assaulted uh, Mr. Sullivan, they were very pleasant in the restaurant. Uh, they only had maybe two rounds. Um, they never caused any problem. I had more issues with other guests, um, including one of the girls I was with them, about getting up from the table and uh, without a face covering. But the four dominant in question were very pleasant. They left in an orderly manner. And besides them not paying, there wasn't really anything that, uh, that I could have given it away that this was going to happen outside of the restaurant. OK, thank you very much. I don't have any other questions. Commissioner Curran or Commissioner Saxon, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Calling item 11. Ristorante Limoncello Inc. doing business as Limoncello Restaurant located at 190 North Street. The date of the incident is September 17th, 2020. Persons under 21 in possession of alcohol on premise in violation of National Law Chapter 138, Section 34. Is the licensee and or their representative present? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Secretary. I think we have, uh, yeah, we're on. I have, uh, it's attorney Stephen Miller uh, representing the licensee. I have with me Maurizio Baldado, who's the owner of the restaurant, and also Susan Lopez, who's one of the managers at the restaurant. And Attorney Miller, are both those individuals with you on camera? They are here. Yes. They can't, they, whoops. There we go, great. And who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? Uh, Detective Hernandez? Be Detective Hernandez. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of this incident who wish to testify? Sergeant William Gallagher, we've called upon. 
and seeing no other individuals, if you could all please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you, Detective Hernandez. You may proceed with the police report. Okay, I'm going to be reading from police report, which I uh, which I wrote um, on Thursday, September 17, 2020, about 10, 10 p.m. Giant Detective Gallagher and Detective Hernandez assigned to licensed crime unit conduct uh, responded to Limoncello located at 190 North Street. Uh, detectives went there to speak to staff regarding uh, a complaint that had been received and refer to incident numbers. There's two incident numbers there. Uh, while standing uh, in the rear temporary patio area, detectives observed a table of six males drinking alcoholic beverages, wine specifically. Uh, detectives noticed that these males looked young and asked them to produce identification to confirm their ages. All individuals immediately stated they were under 21 years of age. Five out of the six males produced their valid driver's license, confirming they were all under 21 years of age. The driver's licenses confirmed the identities of Dolan Smith, Jack Hurley, Matthew Esposito, Elkin Deegan, Alex Buccino, and uh, the six males identification was later confirmed by the Registry of Motor Vehicles to be Luke uh, Bugiglio. Uh, detectives asked the group how they obtained the beverages they had in front of them. All individuals stated that the server did not ask them for any identification. Uh, the restaurant server confirmed that he did not ask the patrons for identification. Detectives brought this to the attention of the person in charge, Mrs. Susan Lopez. All the individuals will be summoned to the court for persons under 21 in possession of alcohol. As a result of what detectives observed, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued license permission inspection notice 023903 for six persons under 21 years of age in possession of alcohol on premise. Ms. Lopez signed for and accepted the notice, which is essentially the facts. Thank you, Attorney Miller. Uh, detective. Was the staff and the management cooperative with you? Extremely. Thank you. Uh, so I have nothing further, Detective. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, um, Mr. Baldado's owned this restaurant for uh, over 20 years, has never had even the slightest issue, has never been appeared before you in the past. The, uh, this was really a wake up call. Um, his staff has been there. I think the junior member of his wait staff has been there 17 years. So they've all been there for a long time. This, and it's a restaurant. This is not a place that someone goes to drink or whatever. Uh, you know, when the people have finished dining, they shut down. They're not looking for any uh, late night business or whatever. So uh, this was truly a wake up call. Uh, when this happened, uh, in fact, the waiter that, uh, neglected to check the IDs happens to be Mr. Baldado's brother. So um, after this incident, um, Susan Lopez and Mr. Baldado had a meeting with the staff. Um, as I said, it's tr was truly a wake up call. They apologize for it. Um, they're in the process of getting the app that uh, the detectives uh, and the sergeant have talked to them about to check IDs. So, um, you know, I don't think you'll be seeing them again on something like this for another 20 years at least. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else with you, Attorney Miller, who wishes to testify or if you... Well, I don't, I don't think they're here to answer any of your questions. Okay. Um, Susan Lopez and Mr. Baldado's here. They'll thank answer you. any of your questions, but as I said, it was, uh, it's our fault, it was an error. Um, uh, people got comfortable. It's not a place that they, you think of someone to go and, and drink. Um, they, you know, they did order food, but uh, it certainly is something we'll be vigilant on in the future. Okay, I don't have any questions. Commissioner Curran, Commissioner Saxon, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. The board will take this matter under advisement. Calling item 12, Ristorante Limoncello, Inc., doing business at Limoncello Restaurant, located at 190 North Street. The date of the incident is September 17th, 2020. Failure to call 911 after incident in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64, and Boards Rule 1.14b, Assault and Battery Abutting Premise, Employees versus Abutters, in violation of Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 64, Chapter 265, Section 13a. 
Attorney Miller, are there any other individuals on behalf of the licensee who wish to testify regarding this matter? Once again, I have Mr. Baldado here and, and Ms. Lopez, Susan Lopez, um, that were here, were there at the time of the incident and, and can answer questions and can testify uh, on this matter. Thank you. And who from the Boston Police Department will be testifying? Sergeant Detective William Gallagher. And are there any other individuals with personal knowledge of this incident who wish to testify? Detective Hernandez, if needed. <clears throat> and for the record, all parties have been sworn in. Sergeant Gallagher, you, can, uh, you may proceed with the police report. Yes, good afternoon, Sergeant Detective William Gallagher, Boston Police, currently assigned license premise unit. This afternoon, I'll be reading a Boston Police incident report that was uh, authored by Cadet Thompson at District A1. On 9-16-2020 at 10.35 hours, Cadet Thompson spoke to Matthew Heyman on the phone, Mr. Heyman being assaulted. Mr. Heyman reported that he lives at 5 Baker's Alley, Apartment 1, Boston, Mass. Mr. Heyman stated that he and his wife, Julian Heyman, have had issues with the restaurant Limoncello at 190 North Street about patio seating located outside their apartment window. Mr. Heyman reported that on numerous occasions, they have requested the manager of Limoncello, Mauricio, to not have large patio tables located right outside their apartment window because of noise complaints. Mr. Heyman reported that at 9.30 hours on 9-12-2020, Riccio approached the victim and his wife on the side of the restaurant building. Mr. Heyman stated that while he and his wife were having a conversation with Mauricio, his wife asked Mauricio to put on his mask while speaking to them. Mr. Heyman stated that after his wife said that, Mauricio began to become aggressive. Mr. Heyman stated that some of Mauricio's wait staff came outside and Mauricio's brother who goes by Chico also came outside. Mr. Heyman stated that while his wife was talking, Chico stated to the victim's wife, shut the fuck up. Mr. Heyman stated that he said, don't speak to my wife like that. Towards Chico, Mr. Heyman stated that one of the wait staff members approached Mr. Heyman and grabbed him by the shirt and pushed him against the wall. Mr. Heyman stated that he was hit with the glass but wasn't sure what direction it came from. Mr. Heyman reported that Mauricio pulled the waiter off and stated to Mr. Heyman, we will call the cops. The victim stated Mauricio, Chico, and the rest of the wait staff went inside the restaurant. Mr. Heyman stated that he and his wife and kids are currently staying in Connecticut because of concerns for family safety. Uh, the second report was authored by myself with a follow-up on 9-17-2020 at about 9.08 p.m. Sergeant Detective William Gallagher and Detective Eddie Hernandez signed the licensed premise unit, conducted a licensed premise inspection of Lemoncello at 190 North Street, Boston. This inspection came about in part because of a BPD Report written by Cadet Clarence Thompson of A1 on 916. In this report, the call of Matthew Heyman of Five Baker's Alley, Boston, stated that he was assaulted by an employee of Limoncello after he objected to another employee swearing at his wife. The incident occurred because of ongoing concerns about COVID guidelines. Detectives did observe a video of the incident provided by Mr. Heyman. In this video, detectives observed an argument, threats, and a shoving match between parties. Detectives inquired with the manager, Susan Lopez, about the incident. She stated the whole incident should be captured by building security. Ms. Lopez gave detectives the contact information from management. Detectives informed Ms. Lopez to save any and all evidence and to have no further contact with Mr. Heyman and his wife. Ms. Lopez went on to say that she believed everything ended on a good note with a hug and apology being exchanged at the end of the incident. She stated that the security cameras should have captured that. Detectives informed Ms. Lopez that it is the responsibility of a licensed premise to call 911 for any and all such incidents. 
As a result of this incident, Sergeant Detective Gallagher issued a license premise inspection notice number 023902 for Limoncello for failure to call 911 after the incident that license premise assault and battery, abiding premise, employees versus bodies. Ms. Susan Lopez signed for and accepted the notice. Those are essentially the other facts. Thank you, Sergeant. And again, for the record, uh, is the alleged victim or any other individual with personal knowledge present? For the record, there is no alleged victim present. Attorney Miller? Uh, yes, Sergeant. Uh, you witnessed the video? Yes, sir, I did. Did you witness any assaults uh, occurring on that video? Yes. What was it? Was it Mr. Heyman lunging at Mr. Baldato? It, it was Mr. Heyman lunging. Uh, the camera, unfortunately, was at his back. I could not see if there was any contact made from the front portion, but I did see Mr. Heyman with a white T-shirt on, lunch first. Correct. And, and, at, and at that point, Chico also, Mr. Um, Baldato, Mr. Baldato's brother, um, interceded. So he didn't um, attack his brother and, and pushed him up against the wall. Did you see that? Yes, sir. That was basically the incident? Uh, there was a small push after that uh, as the parties were walking away. But you didn't see any punches thrown, did you? No punches. Uh, has, uh, was uh, Ms. Lopez and Mr. Baldado cooperative? Yes, sir. Thank you, I have no further questions. So, uh, Madam Chair, uh, the, uh, the reason that the police weren't called, I'll address that right off the bat. Um, in, the, in the video, I think it, um, it says, some, uh, uh, may show uh, Mr. Valdado saying, get the police. Uh, there was a policeman having dinner in the restaurant that evening. Um, they don't know his last name, but his name is Bob. So they did get Bob, who um, came out and spoke to uh, Mr. Heyman and his wife. Uh, Mr. Heyman's wife, um, they had both been out drinking. It was Miss, Mrs. Heyman's birthday. They had both been out drinking. Uh, Mrs. Heyman was clearly intoxicated. And uh, the police officer got involved to calm things down and told them to um, that they should just let it go and, and move on and, and pack it in. So uh, that's the reason they did not call the police at that point, because there was a policeman already involved in it. Unfortunately, we don't know Bob's last name, but I suppose if it was necessary, uh, we could find him and I'm sure he'd support what uh, was said. The this question about a glass being thrown, in fact, Mr. Heyman was um, holding a glass and dropped it. Um, so, you know, a lot of this story is uh, one-sided from Mr. Heyman and only Mr. Heyman. When he states that his uh, family was staying in Connecticut because they were afraid of, for their safety, the fact is that they bought a home in Connecticut and moved out of this apartment three days after this incident. So the, the whole story doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, once again, the uh, Mr. Baldado um, has owned this place for 20 years, has never had an incident anywhere close to this. It wasn't, you know, it's not an incident for him over serving someone. It's an incident for these people um, who were clearly intoxicated, particularly the wife, um, causing, causing a, a commotion at the restaurant complaining about a table um, that was was blocking their window or whatever. And, and in all this time, um, Mr. Uh, Baldado and Ms. Lopez have done everything they could to accommodate these people, but it didn't seem to be working out. But in fact, they've now, they've now uh, left the area. Um, when when uh, Mr. Baldado's brother got involved, he was just, uh, he got in the middle of it to protect his brother was known more as a restaurant person than a, than a uh, fighter. So uh, I guess growing up, he knows his brother doesn't like to fight anybody. 
the uh, the I, I just have uh, the incident was wrapped up pretty uh, nicely, and I just have Miss Lopez uh, just tell you what exactly happened once uh, once the policeman got involved. Um, the <clears throat> the wife left to go someplace else to go drinking, but the, the husband stayed. And Miss Lopez spent some time talking to the husband, so I'll have her explain that to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the fact of the matter is these people have been living there for quite some time. Um, we've gotten to know the wife pretty well. She got married, had two beautiful children. They live on the basement apartment of the building. Um, we did have tables right by their windows and we offered to move them. We did everything we could according to the property manager and ourselves to make it feasible for them. Um, Maurizio even offered to buy them soundproof windows, uh, buy them um, darkening shades, whatever they needed. Um, they did have four people sleeping in a large studio slash small one bedroom. So it was tight. Um, their children were small. Um, at the end of the um, argument, um, I just said to Matt, I said, you know, Matt, this is like really got to stop. What do you want us to do? Tell us what you want us to do. And he said, well, I said, we cannot just rearrange everything constantly for you. I said, clearly Jillian's, you know, feeling good. She left. She left him to finish the argument or whatever. Um, I ended up, I said, well, could you do me a favor? Um, just in the morning, talk about it. And please come for dinner tomorrow. It was just me working. And we'll all sit down and talk about it. I said, you know, it's just, it's getting out of sort that you're just looking nitpicky. Then we come to find out that all in this time, they've been buying a house in Connecticut. So <clears throat> they were looking for reasons to build a case against everybody, not to pay fees or whatever. Um, and they never showed up for the dinner because we never saw them again. And they moved out like three days later, I believe. Can I say something, please? Wait, wait. Yeah, the reason why I said on the video that I will call the police on them it's not because the accident, the incident, because it was nothing. The incident was nothing. He jumped on me. My brother tried to protect me. The reason why I said I will call the police on you because you are constantly intoxicated with two kids every single night. My friend owns a liquor store. She goes to buy liquor at 11 o'clock at night with a baby in her hand, buying liquor at 11 p.m. at night on Salem Street. Wild duck, wild mm -hmm. duck, okay. That's the reason why I said I will call the police on you because you're constantly drunk every single night and you have two kids. Okay. I think that's it, Madam Chair. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Commissioner Saxon or Commissioner Curran, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Seeing no questions, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Board will now take a second call for item three, News Corporation doing business as Casa Colombia, Restaurante, Ice Cream and Bakery. Is the landlord present? Okay. Attorney Cicero, are you still with us? She does not appear to, this is attorney Beltre. She does not appear to be in her office, but I see the clients oh. here. I see the clients moving around looking for her. All right, we'll wait a minute. And again, for the record, is the landlord of the licensed premise present? Someone named Claudia Sierra has raised their hand. I am actually in support. Um, so whenever you want to give the testimony, I'm ready. I'm sorry, ma'am. The, the only testimony that the board can accept is personal knowledge of the alleged incident. This is not an. This is not a hearing regarding a proposed license. Okay. Hello. 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 Yes. Are you the landlord? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know how to use this and. I just have my son help me, so. Uh, Thank you. Thanks yes, for sticking with us. Okay, give us a second to get all the parties uh, back and together. And um, 
I'll let Leslie take it from there. Is and your is your attorney um, is attorney Cicero free? I, I don't know. I don't know. She's in her own office. Huh? Oh yeah, we, we she's not see, my attorney. She's no, I know. We can see her um, office, but her desk is empty. It looks like oh, her friends are trying to find her. And I'm sorry, uh, Joe. Could you please state your name for the record? Joe Recupero. R I C U P E R O. And sir, um, I'm going to trust. Uh, if you can't turn your video on, uh, could you please raise your right hand? Are you yes. I'm right. Uh, uh, do you swear? Fine. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Leslie, where do we leave off? We left off. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Recupero, I, I, I think uh, the, the prior testimony was regarding the uh, Luz Corporation, who is the prior licensee in this space, and I believe the, the specific request by the board, as we've received numerous uh, correspondences regarding who is actually has the legal right to occupy this space, we were hoping that you, as the landlord, could clarify who you believe is operating a common vitular license at your at your license premise uh the the tenant right now is uh walter I, I don't know his last name okay do you have a lease agreement with walter yes i do and when when did that um lease begin i believe it was july um okay And sir, were you, were you under the impression that uh, Walter had obtained a valid license to be operating at the premise? Well, I assume so, yes. And sir, just, just to clarify, this hearing today is because the prior licensee, the Luz Corporation had been operating without a license at the premise since 2017, and that was brought to the board's attention. We have our staff has been proactively working with uh, reaching out to the prior licensee as well as attorney Cicero to determine what the actual status of, is of this space. And we've received uh, conflicting information about legally what is what is taking place there. Well, I always assumed they had a license. Obviously, you renew them every year or whatever it is. I'm not really sure how licenses work. All I am is the landlord there. I had rented it to the, uh, we, uh, the loose corporation had a lease that expired. And um, we were negotiating a new lease with her attorney and um, she never signed the lease, uh, a new one. So she abandoned it. She never paid the rent. So I tried to call her attorney to find out what was going on. Are we doing this or we're not? Not able to get a hold of him. I called him maybe two or three times, no response. Then one day, the daughter of the previous uh, owner called me uh, to say, uh, you know, I left a message. I wasn't in the office to say to call back. Her mother would like to talk to me. I called back, but there was no answer. So I called back the next day and I talked to the daughter. And I told the daughter, well, have your mother call me. If it's important, just have her call me. I never heard from her. So I assumed she just abandoned me. Uh, then Walter came, approached me that he would like to lease it. He was subleasing it, from what I understand, from the loose corporation. That's the way I understood it. They had an agreement. It was something I agreed to years ago, a few years ago. And uh, so he wanted to continue with it. So I saw no reason not to. So we, I did a lease with him. And we signed it, I believe it was July. Okay. Um, how many years did uh, the Les Corporation have a, uh, have a lease with you? They had a five year lease, but they had a, I think it was five years before that even. So was, they were there a long time. Okay. And but, how many uh, months went by when they didn't pay the rent between 
the Lez Corporation not paying the rent, you working with the daughter and the owner, and Mr. Um, and, and Walter's team coming on? It was maybe three or four months. So she, pay, she was paying up until April? I believe so, yes. I'd have to go back into my records and find out exactly. So she paid up until April. Did you, um, had her lease expired? Did you stop proceedings to notify her of her, her rights and your rights? Or did Walter yeah. just, what happened there? You could, just never, you could just never get a hold of her, no matter what. I'd go down there, I'd, I'd, I'd speak to the uh, people, uh, the employees, and she was never there, and I just could not get a hold of her. Okay, so who did you collect rent from going back as far as 2017? It was from, I, I would get the rent from uh, her. Okay. Not her personally, she would send her daughter or somebody up to pay it. But it was always behind, it was never on time. Okay. okay. Um. If you, if you don't mind just hanging on a minute. Um, sure. Walter, is your attorney joining us? Say something. Hello? Hello? Hi, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Leslie, is she um, all sworn in and everything? As, a, as an attorney, she, she does not need to be sworn in. Uh, I believe your client was sworn in. Are there any attorneys, Sarah, are there any other individuals who, are, who will be testifying regarding this matter? Uh, no, we just have uh, Walter Castaneda. Okay. I have uh, somebody who can translate for him. Okay. Is that okay? Can he talk? Yeah. Okay, we have an issue here where there's no valid CV license to operate this. So that is why you were closed down on Friday night. But you've been notified several times that you don't have a, a valid inspectional services um, certificate. And that means your license to operate has been expired. And it's been expired since 2017. So whether or not you have a right to occupy this place, Either way, you 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 don't have the, the proper licensing. Right. Because he was unaware that he needed that license because the one who the person who was in charge of the licensing was was uh, the uh, her, uh, business level, right? The person who was in charge of the license, what? The person in charge of licensing was um, Mr. Restrepo. Yes. Sorry, can you hear me? Is this is not really. The amount of background noise behind you. Could you mute whatever is in the background? Um, I'm at, that's actually here in the office, so I don't know. Hi there. This is attorney Monteiro. I work with attorney Cicero. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Okay, basically, there's no, not a valid license here. Um, whether or not in, uh, the, you have a valid, a legal right to occupy the premise is another question, which I'm not able to determine today, but there's, you can't operate without a valid license and we don't have the right information. Is Walter one of the people in the office today? Yes. And is Walter on the managing agreement, management agreement or the sublease? No sublease. Okay. Um, I know our, my staff, um, if Attorney Cicero could hear me, my staff is working very hard and has been working very hard to, with her to try to straighten out this information, despite her aggressive and belligerent emails 
So I'd like to address that as well. Um, in order for us to get everything up and going, we need her cooperation. Or whoever in the office is working on this. Leslie, could you explain for the record exactly what is missing and what we need to review and that the, this location will remain closed until we get that information? Absolutely. At, at this juncture, despite the fact that the board has reached out repeatedly to, since June to uh, Attorney Cicero regarding the fact that there is no license there and there is not a complete application on file, this location has remained in operation. Attorney Cicero was given an additional seven days leading up to last Friday to provide the application and all the relevant information, which she failed to do. As you are aware that this location was ordered closed. This location has not had a valid common visitor license, a valid inspectional service department certificate of inspection, or a valid health certificate since 2017. This is a public health issue. The board staff is currently reviewing the additional documents provided by attorney Cicero. However, one of the outstanding issues is that the lease agreement runs to an individual as opposed to the proposed licensee entity at this location. So until that is cleared up, as well as the discrepancies between the corporate summary statement on the Secretary of State's website and the proposed, uh, the proposed structure of the new licensee, we cannot move forward with granting any sort of hearing for a common vitular license at this location. Again, the board staff is more than committed to working with the applicant to ensure a timely hearing. However, the board cannot act on an incomplete application. So again, we will put the board's email, which attorney Cicero is very familiar with, in the chat. And we're happy to continue working on this. However, as the chairwoman said, it, it would be helpful if we had a more polite point person who was not sending threatening emails to the staff. Okay. May I? Good afternoon. So Tony Monteiro, I could uh, uh, take the case uh, moving forward. I could be the contact person and uh, the person making all communications with your office, if that would uh, help alleviate the tension and between the parties. So I could do that. And then in terms of the lease, we just have a new lease. These are, this is a situation where the owner of the business or never renewed the license for the last three years. We did work with the uh, inspectional services and obtain permits. However, we didn't have a license as you indicated. Uh, we uh, submitted the application back in Mar uh, June. Uh, it was brought in in person to City Hall. Uh, for some reason, it got lost and we're working on getting all the uh, documents together for uh, the new license. So I hope it, that the city can issue the, the license as soon as possible. This is a company that employs over 20 people and they are at risk, I mean, at this point, with no, um, no job or no income. And uh, we will do everything that possible. We're not arguing that this is a valid license. We just wanted like an expedite way to get the slices. Okay, so business in operation. I want to summarize that you summarize for everyone here today. Um, yeah. We will be using me Samonte as our contact person moving forward, and you'll work cooperatively with my staff. Yes. Um, you acknowledge that you do not have a valid license that you cannot operate until we get all the proper pa paperwork. Yes. And I want you to know that the outdoor patio is not able to be operated. And the reason why is that we as a city and as this department, we expedited the process assuming that those people that applied had a valid license. The burden was on you and your client to prove to us you had a valid license. Therefore, you did not. Yes. So my, staff was not my staff is not at fault for giving you permission to use a space you had no right to occupy. Yes, we saw the email. Oh, oh, so you saw the emails that came in the yes. last couple of minutes? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Great. So please stop emailing sure. until you have all of the proper information. Mm -hmm. I, we will. Uh, briefly on the record as to Lose Corporation. May I finish? In terms of uh, timing, 
uh, once we submit, we won't send a bunch of emails. Once we have all the information, what are we looking for? Is it possible to get a, a, a temporary license? No, I am not giving you a temporary license. No. Okay. Okay. So what are we talking about? We haven't had a proper license in three years, so we need to review all the materials. So I urge so you, on behalf, of, be on behalf of your 20 employees, I urge you to get on this quickly because my staff yes. is working every single day. And for you to get your 20 employees back working, I urge you to work cooperatively with us. Yes, definitely. We'll, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I am a, a promising and you will see there will be cooperation. There's not going to be side issues. We have to get the license. That's more okay. important. Uh, now I was just hoping that maybe what we're going to work it diligently and bring all the documents. I was just looking in time frames if everything is correct. What are we looking for uh, at? Attorney Monte, we can't advise on a hearing date until we have a complete application. Once we have a complete okay. application, we will work with you to schedule the first available hearing date for your client. However, given mm -hmm. history, we cannot advise on a hearing date unless and until that is the we will work okay. quickly once we have all of the proper information. Sure. Thank you. And I believe there was another request. Yes, um, Madam Chair, may I just uh, state something for the record as to Lou's Corporation, which is technically um, what's on the agenda for today? Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, state for the record that the recitation of facts that was just provided is very misleading as the employers are deemed to be the employees of the loose corporation based on this management agreement slash sublease agreement. And the chronology of applications submitted to the Boston Licensing Board is very, very concerning based on the fact that we received a letter of offer to purchase in, Jul in August. And so whatever was been submitted or provided to the, city, to the city hall, in light of the fact that Mr. Castaneda's, one, our argument is that froze my client out of her business, two, um, misled the uh, landlord, but then now I'm hearing for the first time that his attorneys are contacting city hall and asking for licenses that I don't believe are, he's entitled to until the resolution in the courts regarding whether there was proper notice to quit by the landlord to Mr. Strepo, there was an attorney, a male attorney previous to my involvement, and there was emails back and forth as late as June and July and August 18th as to my client asking for information. And so I don't know the chronology um, or the back and forth that led Mr. Recupero to believe that she was has abandoned the, lo the location. There was no such abandonment since in her mind, Mr. Castaneda was there as her agent. And so I would just um, ask the uh, board, in addition to the documents that I provided and will continue to provide with permission um, of the board, um, that no uh, decision be um, made on a, an application or a packet that's deemed complete because there are still lit issues that clearly now need to be litigated as they were not able to be resolved um, without court intervention. Attorney, could you? No, attorney, I no. Thank you. Um, attorney, could you, I just want to make it clear, your client has not renewed their license since 2017, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. I mean, Madam Chair. Um, what I have discovered in my involvement, and I've been involved now for barely eight weeks on this case, is that um, it was his responsibility, the manager that she assigned, uh, Mr. Castaneda. And so now there's this back and forth on who was responsible. Obviously, ultimately, she's the corporation and she's the owner, but there was this sublease agreement that was just attested to by the landlord that was agreed upon by the landlord. And he utterly failed, Mr. Castaneda, to keep up the licenses or permits. And, and as I stated in a, in a communication to the board, he also has failed to pay any taxes to DOR. Uh, creating a responsibility and a liability of almost $30,000 to the corporation. And so okay, I'm just going to jump in and ask another question. Could you summarize for us what are the issues that are being litigated in court? Um, yes, the issues that will be litigated in court, um, Madam Chair, are his breach of contract, his interference with her relationship with the landlord, his failure to um, comply with the um, contract, which included paying all of the tax liabilities. This is a restaurant, so there's 
Now we've discovered almost $30,000 in unpaid taxes and the fact that he put Ms. Uh, Restrepo and Luz Corporation's licenses and permits in jeopardy because he did not renew them. Um, that was his sole responsibility to keep up with everything relating to the business while she was taking care of her son who's battling cancer. And so we're talking about those two major issues that deal with the Commonwealth and the municipality. But then most important, which was my main focus in the beginning, Madam Chair, is that he violated federal copyright laws by promoting a soccer match and paying for that. And so that also exposed Mr. Restrepo and Luz Corporation to a federal lawsuit in the, in the tune of over $200,000. I've been negotiating with the owner of the license because ultimately she is strictly liable, but he's the one that was managing the restaurant. He's the one that promoted and the evidence um, that I was provided by the um, attorneys for that license holder clearly demonstrate that. Um, and so we have a lot of issues that um, are convoluted and some are appropriate to put before you guys and some of them just really need to be fleshed out um, in litigation or hopefully with a, a, a really substantive conversation with the landlord. But these three very egregious actions while he was supposed to be managing this restaurant would, should be of concern to a board in, in assessing whether he should be provided licenses. Councilor, and just to provide an overview on what we're looking at today and what the next steps are. We have a licensee who has not renewed their license for a period of three years. That licensee also allegedly entered into a management agreement for a city of Boston issued license that was never disclosed nor approved by this board. We have an operator who stepped in and began operating under an expired license without any notice to the board. And we have an incomplete application before this board for a new operator. In order to prevent the issuance of a subsequent common vitular license, if a completed application is received by this board, it would require a court order. So I strongly suggest that any pending litigation, any future litigation, the board be apprised of. Because the board, if there is a complete application and the board finds there is a public need and an appropriate operator at this location, it will require a court order or pending litigation and proof of the same in order to not issue that license. This does not speak to the appropriateness of the proposed operator. This is just simply the legal standard. And we will most certainly provide notice um, to the board um, once we uh, get more involved in the litigation. So I thank you for your time. And for the proposed licensee entity, you cannot begin operations unless and until a completed CV application has been filed with the board, a hearing has been held, this would only be if the board chooses to grant this CV at this location, your inspectional services department certificate of inspection is issued and your public health uh, certificate of inspection is issued. This location will not be allowed to continue operations unless and until all of these ongoing issues of which all parties have had notice for a significant amount of time are rectified. And I appreciate the, um the summary. I would just note that because of these issues between Mr. Castaneda and Mr. Strepo, she actually had no notice about the incidents in June. We just found out last week and that's why I contacted um, the board last week. So now that we know what's going on and what's pending, we will be on top of that and provide all necessary documentation um, and hopefully a court order to the board. And to be clear, the notice of the license premise violations were hand delivered to the establishment. So that is your client's issue with not having control over the license premise. That is not correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not trying to say she didn't receive proper notice because the notice goes to the restaurant. I just wanted to let you know that because of her issues with Mr. Castaneda, he failed to let her know what was going on. And you know, we now found out, but we're not disputing notice at all. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any other questions for any of the parties involved? I don't. Commissioner Kern, Commissioner Saxon, do you have any other questions for the parties involved? Not at this time. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to the licensed permission unit and the board staff who have been working diligently on this issue. This thank you so much. Right.